Sitting in LaGuardia Airport in New York wasn't the most enjoyable way to spend an evening, thought Max Tronder as he watched the boarding process for what he hoped would be his flight back home to Charlotte. Max, along with his two sisters, owned a small pharmaceutical company created by their father decades earlier. The father had developed a series of valuable but rarely used drugs that made the company profitable but never offered much growth opportunity. Both parents had passed, and Max had spent the last few days in New York negotiating the sale of the company to a major pharmaceutical concern. Max, along with his lawyers and brokers, had reached a deal today, so he was leaving it to them to finish the contract negotiations. Max hoped to get home tonight, but it looked doubtful. The last flight of the day to Charlotte was fully booked, and he was number three on the wait list. He hadn't called his wife, Camille, because he wasn't sure what to tell her. He sat at a bar where he could watch the gate and drank his second gin and tonic, thinking about the deal and the money he and his sisters would share, something over $10 million for him, plus... A well-compensated transition period with the pharmaceutical company meant a new lifestyle for him and Camille. Their twin girls were already out of the nest, or at least on their way. Both were attending college as juniors at Duke, where the tuition was a heavy burden, but that would all change when the deal closed. Meanwhile, the boarding process was finishing, and the gate agents were ushering the last passenger into the jetway. Then, a bit of a miracle, the boarding sign changed, and Max saw his name appear as having cleared the waitlist. He threw money on the bar, waved at the bartender, who gave him a thumbs up, grabbed his briefcase and overnight bag, and sprinted to the gate. The gate agent handed him a boarding pass and quickly explained to him and two other waitlisters that a party of four who had checked in remotely had failed to show, so they got the seats. Max ran down the jetway with his new companions, and as he arrived at the boarding door, he realized he had gotten a first-class seat. A good sign, he thought. Settling into first class, he felt optimistic. Maybe that meant the deal would really close. The boarding door closed as he sat down, and the flight attendant asked if he wanted something to drink. As they taxied to the runway, he felt like he had earned one more drink, so he ordered another gin and tonic then fell asleep, dreaming of a future for him and Camille with enough money to always travel comfortably. The bump and screech of landing woke him up. He eventually got to the taxi stand to take a cab home. He had driven his pickup to the airport a few days earlier, but now he was exhausted, a bit tipsy, and it was really late, way too late to call Camille to come get him. They lived a few miles outside of Charlotte so the taxi ride was long enough for him to doze off again. The driver had to wake him when they arrived. Max paid him and added a generous tip before getting out of the cab sluggishly. It had been a long, stressful day and half the night, and he was already thinking of snuggling into bed with Camille. As the cab backed away and he turned toward the house, what he saw stopped him in his tracks. A gold-colored Mercedes was parked in the driveway in front of his side of the garage. It looked like a very fancy car to Max, but then all Mercedes looked fancy to him. The house was dark, it was past midnight by then, and Max stood there for a few moments. He had talked to Camille from his lawyer's office around midday, and she hadn't mentioned having overnight visitors. He tried to avoid thinking the unthinkable, wanting to imagine a happy scenario where he would soon be snuggling with a warm, sleepy Camille. In just a few minutes, his mind wasn't working that way, though, so he slowly walked to the door in the breezeway between the garage and house. He unlocked it, stepped into the silent house, and even more slowly made his way through the kitchen and up the stairs to his and Camille's bedroom. The bedroom door stood open, obviously with no expectation of visitors. Max stepped inside and felt a wave of disbelief wash over him. His mind seemed to freeze as he took in the sight before him. Camille was sleeping, her body sprawled across her side of the bed, one arm draped across a man who was also asleep, a faint smile on his face. Max stood there, seemingly frozen in time, until eventually his thoughts began to process again. He looked again at Camille's arm across the man, her hand resting on his chest. 
No wonder the guy was smiling in his sleep. They were both snoring, and that broke Max's heart. Before tonight, he had loved hearing Camille's soft snoring, which felt like a comforting purr. He had thought it meant she felt safe, resting deeply in a shared life with him. He had often drifted off to sleep with that soothing sound in his ears, but now it felt like a distant memory. As Max's thoughts began to clarify, he noticed the man's clothes folded carefully on a chair, where he had sat hundreds of times. A smoldering fury started to ignite within him. He picked up the pants and pulled out the wallet and car keys, pausing to think. He could grab a tennis racket from the bedroom closet and confront the man, but he realized that while it might feel satisfying in the moment, it could lead to bigger problems down the line. An idea began to take shape. He pulled out his cell phone and snapped a few incriminating pictures. After capturing the evidence, he gathered up the man's clothes and shoes. The intruder was a large guy. Max was 5 feet 10 inches and about 160 pounds, while this man appeared to be at least 4 or 5 inches taller and perhaps 50 pounds heavier. Confronting him with a tennis racket might not have been wise. With the clothes and shoes in hand, Max took one last look at his wife, the woman he had loved, the mother of his precious daughters, and steeled himself against that love that had sustained him for over twenty years. He left the bedroom, no tears yet, and headed back down the stairs and outside. The key fob beeped as the Mercedes doors unlocked. Max put his briefcase and overnight bag inside and slid into the driver's seat, he had never been a fan of fancy cars, but as he sat in the sleek interior, he realized he liked it. Figuring out the controls, he put the car in gear and drove off. After about a mile, he pulled over to take a look at the man's wallet. Inside were the usual items, some cash, business cards, and an ID indicating that the man was Franklin Thompson, a senior sales associate at a local Mercedes dealership with a driver's license showing an address in Charlotte. If Franklin had a family there, Max thought, he could cause some real trouble, not just for Franklin, but perhaps for Camille as well. Feeling exhausted, Max decided to head to a nearby motel for the night. Meanwhile, Camille was a careful person. She knew she wasn't as clever as Max, but her caution had allowed her affair with Franklin to continue for almost five months without raising his suspicions. As she lay in bed the next morning with Franklin, she thought about how he was decent enough in bed, maybe not quite as good as Max, but the difference outside the bedroom was significant. She concluded that it was time to end the affair. She had enjoyed the physicality of being with a man like Franklin, reminiscent of the football player she had dated in college. However, Franklin was becoming too possessive, wanting to spend the night with her. While she had allowed it this time, she resolved it would be the last. Camille planned to spend her life with Max and having another man in their marriage bed, even if Max would never find out, felt too disrespectful. As the alarm went off at 7 a.m., it was time for one last quick encounter. Afterward, they both headed to the shower. Back in her bedroom, Camille was dressing when Franklin emerged from the guest room shower, towel wrapped around his waist. He paused for a moment then asked, Where did you move my clothes? I didn't move them anywhere, she replied, a bit impatiently. They were right there on that chair. But they're gone. Did you take them into the guest room with you? He asked, his voice trailing off as he tried to make sense of the situation. Maybe you left them downstairs when we came in last night, Camille suggested. I'm sure I didn't, but I guess I'll go look, Franklin replied as he headed out of the bedroom. He returned quickly, rushing up the stairs. Camille, my car is gone. My clothes aren't downstairs. Somebody was here last night. They took my clothes. They stole my car. What is going on? Franklin's words tumbled out in a panic, and Camille struggled to make sense of it. How could his clothes and car be missing? The two of them had been in the house all night. Had someone broken in? Suddenly, Camille felt overwhelmed and collapsed onto the bed. What? Franklin asked, confused. Taking a moment to gather her thoughts, Camille finally said, What if it was Max? What if he came home from New York, 
while we were sleeping and took your stuff and your car. Oh, hell, Franklin muttered as he sat down next to her. You need to find out where he is. If he's still in New York, that means we need to call the cops. I have to get my stuff back. Franklin's frustration was palpable. If we call the cops, they'll want to know who owns the car, and it's titled in my wife's name for tax reasons. His voice trailed off as he considered the implications of their situation. I'll call his office. His secretary comes in really early. She'll know where he is, Camille said, pulling out her phone. She dialed Max's office, and despite it being early, his secretary answered immediately. Max Tronder's office. May I help you? Hi, Sheila. This is Camille. I know it's really early, but I'm not sure where Max is. He didn't call last night. Have you heard from him? It is early, and I know the team in New York worked late last night. They're probably just getting a late start today. I talked to Max around six yesterday. He said they were making good progress and might have a deal today. That's great to hear. So he's still in New York? Yes, I'm sure. I expect to hear from him as soon as they all get back to the office. Do you want me to ask him to call you? Yes, please, but only if he has time. I know how important this deal is. Okay, I'll do that. Bye. After hanging up, Camille turned to Franklin. Max is still in New York. We need to think about calling 911 to report a break-in and car theft. Camille, what do we tell them? That your lover had his clothes stolen from your bedroom and his car from your driveway. We are really screwed here. Okay, I get it. Let's think this through. How about I drive you to your house? You can change and report the thefts as if they happened there while your wife was taking the kids to school. Maybe you don't report the stolen clothes that might be harder to explain than the car. Except I told my wife I was going to Atlanta for a meeting about the new Mercedes S-Class and wouldn't be home until this afternoon. The plan could still work. We just wait until noon when you'd be getting back anyway. You stop by home. Leave the keys in the car since it was a quick stop, and your car gets stolen while you're in the house. You know, I think that might work. I could say I left my wallet in the car, and they took that too. We can hang out here for a few hours, maybe need another shower. Okay, I need to call into work to take a sick day, Camille said. She worked as a paralegal at a small law firm. The work was fine, but a bit dull. She stepped into the hallway to make the call and returned to find Franklin back in bed, towel around his waist, getting ready. She felt a moment of temptation but remembered her decision to end the affair. Franklin, she said, making no move to undress. I think it's time to end this. We've had a good run, but it could have been Max last night. We were lucky it was just the thief. Let's find you some clothes and maybe grab breakfast at a drive through Franklin looked at her, contemplating trying to change her mind, but ultimately realized she was right. Okay, I agree. It has been a good run. What about some clothes? That turned out to be a challenge. Franklin was about 50 pounds heavier and four inches taller than Max. After some searching, Camille found a pair of ragged old sweatpants that sort of fit him after cutting some material at the waist and tying shoelaces around his middle. She also found a faded sweatshirt that had shrunk in the wash and modified it to fit. They decided to watch TV until it was time to head to Franklin's house. Earlier that morning, just as Franklin was discovering his missing clothes and car, Max had pulled into the driveway of the address on Franklin's driver's license, a nice house that seemed to hold many secrets. Max sat in the car for a moment, taking in the nice house with a small bicycle leaning against the side of the garage. He had spent the night in a motel and gone for a run at dawn. Surprisingly, he wasn't feeling worse. Maybe he was still in shock. He approached the front door, holding Franklin's wallet with the driver's license visible, and rang the bell. A young woman in her twenties answered the door. Max wore a wrinkled suit from the day before, hoping he didn't look too threatening. He held up the driver's license and pointed at the gold Mercedes parked outside. Before he could speak, the woman slammed the door but quickly reopened it, holding her cell phone. 
I have 911 on speed dial, unless you tell me my husband is okay. Ma'am, I have a picture of your husband and my wife together last night, Max replied. Honestly, I don't think your husband is okay, and I don't think my wife is either. If you want to call 911, go ahead. I'll just wait in the car. They exchanged a tense moment of silence until her expression shifted, and she opened the door wider. Come in, she said, before disappearing into the kitchen at the sound of a child calling for her. Max waited in the living room, and when she returned, she offered him a cup of coffee. I hope you drink it black. I have to get my kids ready for school. Right now, I trust you more than I trust my husband. Okay, Max replied. I think we're both in a tough spot. She hurried off to get her kids ready, introducing Max as a friend of Daddy's, before rushing them out the door. Alone, he sat and sipped the coffee, contemplating calling his office but ultimately remaining still. When she came back down, she looked more put together, her hair calmed, and some makeup applied. Sorry about the earlier chaos. I'm Molly Thompson, currently married to Franklin Thompson, who is involved with the woman you're married to. Max chuckled at her phrasing, feeling a bit lighter. You're absolutely right. I'm Max Tronder, and my wife is Camille Tronder. He explained the events of the previous night, watching tears well up in Molly's eyes. Camille and I are getting a divorce, and I believe the photos will help me in that process. I can send them to you if you think you might need them. Maybe I should have them, Molly replied, her gaze distant. But then she paused. Wait, don't send them. If I see them, I won't be able to forget them. You keep them, and if I need them, I'll contact you. Sure, Max said, then added, I may not be at my current job much longer, and I'll definitely be leaving my home soon. Let me give you my lawyer's information. You can reach him if you need those pictures or help with your divorce. Thanks, Molly said. But what do we do now? Are you returning the car? Are you waiting for Franklin? He was supposed to be in Atlanta for a meeting. I think I'll keep the car until someone tells me to return it. Molly burst out laughing. You know, I can write you a permission slip since the car is technically mine. If you get pulled over, the cops can call me to confirm. Max liked the idea. That sounds good. And we've had a lot of break-ins in the neighborhood lately. If Franklin's keys and clothes are missing, and the hidden key in the backyard is gone when he gets here, he might try to break in. If our security system goes off, that could bring the police. Honestly, Molly, I think I'm falling in love with your resourcefulness. Max said, genuinely impressed. Okay, calm down. Franklin might wait until the kids and I are back from school this afternoon, but I can take them to the park for a while to give him more time to deal with whatever mess he's in. Please keep me updated, especially if he gets into trouble with the police, and call me when you need the car back. I don't want you to get in any trouble. Max nodded, then left in the gold Mercedes, contemplating how much a car like it would cost in a different color. Molly had given him the permission slip, and he assumed she would set the alarm and leave for the day. Around noon, Camille and Franklin arrived at his house. She dropped him off and sped away, as if trying to escape the situation. Franklin approached the front door, hoping it might be unlocked, but also dreading the possibility. Of course, it was locked, so he hurried to the backyard to check the spot where they kept the spare key. It was gone. Great, he muttered, contemplating whether to break in. He tried the back door, but it was locked too. With no other choice, he decided to break in. He selected the family room window, the largest one, and grabbed a branch from a tree to help him. Using two chairs from the deck to avoid stepping on the glass, he took a deep breath and swung the branch into the window. It shattered with a loud crash, but the alarm system immediately went off. Unfortunately for him, a police cruiser happened to be passing by at that moment, thanks to Molly's earlier call about break-ins in the neighborhood. Crap, Franklin muttered, scrambling to climb over the chairs to silence the alarm. But he was too late. Stop right there. Back away from the house slowly and put your hands in the air, shouted one of the officers, 
guns drawn. Franklin complied, awkwardly backing away. Officers, I can explain, he began, but one cop interrupted, handcuffing him before he could finish. They recited his Miranda rights, and one officer asked if he had anything to say. Yes, this is my house, and I don't have my key. I was just trying to get some clothes and call my office. He stammered, glancing down at his mismatched outfit. Do you have any ID? One officer asked. Uh, no. I lost my car and all my stuff. It's been a rough morning, Franklin admitted, feeling the pressure. How did you lose your car? The officer pressed. Franklin hesitated, not wanting to reveal the whole story. I was staying at a friend's house, and when I woke up, the car was gone. I didn't report it because I thought I'd find it. Did you leave it at a bar? The officer asked. Franklin knew he had to come up with a believable excuse. You can call my wife. She can verify who I am. Maybe you could give me a ride to my office so I can get some clothes. One officer took down Molly's number and stepped aside to call her. Franklin could hear the conversation. Ma'am, this is Officer Rills with the Charlotte Police. We have a man here who claims to be your husband. He was trying to break into your house because he lost his clothes. Yes, ma'am. We'll wait. Thank you. When the officer returned, he looked serious. Your wife says she's in Atlanta, and anyone breaking into her house is a burglar. But Franklin's voice broke as they led him to the police cruiser. Meanwhile, Camille had driven to her office, running late but hoping to catch up. She still hadn't heard from Max and decided to call this cell, but there was no answer. She then called his office. Hi, Sheila. It's Camille. I'm getting a bit worried about Max. Have you heard from him? No, I haven't. That means he's still in New York with the lawyers. It's really unlike him not to call. You sound worried, so I'll check up on him. Either he or I will call you back in a few minutes. Okay, thanks, Sheila. You're the best. A few minutes later, Camille received a call back. Camille, it's Sheila. I spoke with the secretary at the law office. Max left late yesterday, hoping to catch the last flight to Charlotte. I called his cell, and he asked me to tell you he'd call you later. Thank you, Sheila. Camille replied as she hung up, feeling a knot grow in her stomach. Max ended his call with Sheila, driving the gold Mercedes to a divorce lawyer recommended by Fred Thomas, his longtime business lawyer. He trusted Fred and hoped to trust this new lawyer too. Mr. Tronder, please have a seat. Miss Reinhardt will be with you shortly. The receptionist informed him. He sat down, somewhat reassured by the lawyer's office, neither overly luxurious nor cheap-looking. Before he could dwell on his worries, a woman in her fifties with dyed red hair entered the reception area. Mr. Tronder, she said. Max nodded, and she continued, I'm Anna Reinhardt. Fred called and told me to take good care of you. Let's go to my office and discuss your situation. Max followed her into a cozy office. After accepting coffee from the receptionist, he explained his situation, his unfaithful wife, his desire for divorce, and his need to protect his assets, especially the proceeds from his and his sister's company. He decided to skip the part about the Mercedes, suspecting it might amuse Anna. Is it okay if I call you Max? She asked, and he nodded. Good news, relatively speaking, given your situation. Fred mentioned that you and your sister owned your company before marrying your wife, so your shares are considered separate property. Your wife has no claim on them, but you need to keep those shares and any sale proceeds separate from joint accounts. That makes sense, Max replied. What about our house and retirement accounts? Not such good news there. Since your salary is higher, you'll likely be paying some alimony for a few years. We can probably avoid retirement account payments by increasing the alimony. I know it's not appealing, but it's better than sharing your retirement funds decades from now. And since your kids are in college, I assume you're okay covering their expenses. Yes that's fine. About the house, I don't want it anymore. I doubt Camille can buy my half, so selling sounds like the best option. I can draw up the papers. The divorce petition is a standard form, 
so I can have it ready for you to review tomorrow. We can serve her in the afternoon, and a proposed settlement agreement can follow next week. That's pretty fast, Max said. Listen to me, Max. If there's a chance for you and your wife, if counseling might help. No, it's just shock I'm dealing with. Less than 24 hours ago, I was excited to return home to my wife and share the news about the company sale. Now I'm here discussing divorce. But go ahead, I'll figure out how to deal with it. Okay, but if you change your mind, just call. Max thanked her, paid a retainer, and left her office. As he walked back to the gold Mercedes, he thought about what was happening with the man he had seen the night before. Remembering he promised to call Camille, he dialed her number. Hello, she answered in her office. Camille, it's Max. You called, looking for me. Oh, Max, thank you for calling. I've missed you. Where are you? I'm here in Charlotte. When did you get back? Last night, he replied, feeling the tension rise. Camille slumped back in her chair, struggling to maintain the conversation. I'm hanging up now. No, please don't, Max urged. Can we meet somewhere? I need to see you. Max hesitated. Camille had been his love, the mother of his daughters, the most important person in his life for over twenty years. Okay, let's meet at Center Cafe at six. The tension mounted for Camille as she agreed. Center Cafe was where she and Max had met long ago, both out with friends. It had been a special place for them ever since, and now she was afraid of why Max had suggested it. But she had to say yes. Max, I'll see you there. And please listen, I'm sorry, and I love you. Max hung up, and Camille sat there, tears streaming down her face, feeling a tightening in her chest. Arriving at the cafe early, Camille ordered a glass of wine and reflected on her feelings of guilt. Her first experiences in college had been intense, and she had thought she was over that part of her life. Max was everything she needed, strong, loving, a great father. But there were moments, when she was alone, that her thoughts wandered back to those past experiences. Max had been away visiting a pharmaceutical company, and she had accompanied him for a weekend getaway. On a flight home, she found herself next to a man who seemed charming at first. They had shared drinks, and she had fallen asleep on his shoulder, waking up to an uncomfortable situation. She knew she should have reacted differently, but instead, she found herself caught up in the moment, making choices she later regretted. Thinking back, Camille felt a mix of relief and guilt. That encounter led to more than she ever intended, and although she had tried to be faithful to Max, the temptation of those past feelings lingered. The guilt she felt now was heavier than before. She had made mistakes, but she loved Max deeply and wanted to make things right. Just then, she saw Max enter. He looked older than she remembered and her heart sank. Hello, Max. Thank you for being here. I don't even know how to start saying how sorry I am. May I ask some questions? He said as he took a seat. Oh, Max, please no. If we have any chance, questions and answers will just kill that chance. Camille, we need to talk. I can't just walk away. The tightness in her chest remained, but Camille knew she had to face this moment. Okay, Max, ask me anything. Do you know what time I got home last night? A strange question. Ah, no, not exactly. And do you know what I saw when I walked upstairs to our bedroom? Yes, I can guess what you must have seen, and I know it was one of the worst things for you. I beg you to please hear me, Max. I'm sorry, sorry enough that I won't contest any kind of divorce you want. If you want to confront me, you can do it right here, and I won't complain. Shut up, Camille. Next question. How many men have you been with since we got married? If you lie, I'll get up and walk out. Camille's first instinct was to lie, but she realized that would be too risky. Her marriage felt broken already. Three, Max. Three men that I wish I had never met. I see in your eyes that our marriage is over, and I understand you deserve someone better. I'm willing to do just about anything to give us another chance, but I understand if you want nothing more to do with me. Get a lawyer. 
You'll be served with divorce papers tomorrow. Max stood up and walked away. Camille sat there, too stunned to cry at first, processing what had just happened. The weight in her stomach pressed down hard, and eventually, tears began to flow. As Max walked away from the cafe, he recalled the first time he and Camille had met there decades ago. Now he wondered if this would be their last intimate conversation. The thought was bitter. Knowing she had been with other men was painful enough, but seeing her with someone else was a wound he couldn't bear. Maybe he could have accepted her past with faceless men over their years together if there had been counseling. But the image of her with that man in their bed felt insurmountable. Their marriage was over, and he finally let the tears come as he sat in the gold Mercedes. Eventually, he realized it was getting dark. He wiped his face and thought about what Molly Thompson had said that morning. She had advised him not to send her pictures of her husband with Camille. Sensing that forgiveness would be harder with visual evidence, he decided to call her to share that thought and check on the status of the car. Hello, Molly answered. Molly, this is Max Tronder from this morning. I'm just checking in on you in the car. Thanks for calling. I'm hanging in there. You can keep the car for now. Franklin is in so much trouble he won't need it for a while. Trouble? I hope you didn't hurt him. No, but he might wish I had. He got arrested for trying to break into our house and took a swing at one of the cops. He's a big guy, and the officer ended up using a taser on him. I think something happened in jail, too. He's not talking about it, but it sounds serious. He called his brother to bail him out, so now his family knows everything. Wow, Molly, I can't say I'm sorry for him, but I'm sorry for you. I'm glad you didn't look at those pictures this morning. If you have any chance of reconciliation, seeing them would complicate things. Yeah, he finally got home a few hours ago, crying and begging me to let him stay. We have two little kids, so I'm trying to work it out, but it won't be easy. His brother, who's a lawyer, advised me to insist on a postnup, and I'll be controlling our finances for a while. Way to go. I wish you all the best. Just let me know when you need the car back. After hanging up, Max sat there, feeling the mix of envy and concern for Molly. Perhaps Franklin had learned a lesson facing legal troubles. He hoped it would help for the sake of their kids. Eventually, Max drove back to the motel where he was staying. He had one more call to make before trying to sleep, to his daughters, Jane and Joan. Hi, Daddy, Jane's voice came through. The twins sounded alike, studying nursing at the same college. Max often thought about how lucky he was that they weren't identical twins. They could be a handful together, and he could only imagine how much more difficult it would be if they looked alike. Yep, you guessed right, of course. You had a 50-50 chance. What's up? Listen, tomorrow is Saturday, and I'd like to take you and your sister out for breakfast. Let's call it brunch, maybe around 11 o'clock at that bistro on 4th Street where we've gone before. Um, that's fine with me. Jane paused, and then you could hear some noise before she came back. It's fine with Joan, too. Can we? He quickly interrupted her. Let's make it just the three of us for tomorrow. Okay, sure, Jane replied. But tell me what's. He interrupted again, not wanting to start a lengthy conversation over the phone. I need to run. See you at eleven. Love you, and tell your sister I love her too. Bye. He hung up, hoping she wouldn't call Camille. After Max left the cafe, Camille was left with his advice, or perhaps a warning, to get a lawyer. Her tears were hard to stop. She knew she had messed up her marriage, her family, her whole life. She worried her daughters would find out, along with her parents and friends. The thought of Max discovering her lying in bed with someone else haunted her. A waitress approached, asking if she needed to move to the ladies' room. Camille sniffled and managed to say, No, thank you. She paid the bill and left, heading toward the home that wouldn't be hers much longer. When she arrived, she poured herself a drink, just enough to help her forget her troubles, hoping for some kind of miracle to bring back Max. The next morning, Max sat in the bistro when his daughters arrived. 
He had reviewed the draft divorce petition earlier that day and spent the drive thinking about how to tell Jane and Joan. After the usual hugs and pleasantries, the conversation turned serious. Daddy, we know something is wrong, Joan said. You look kind of sick. Are you here to tell us you have cancer or something? If so, where's mom? Yes, I do have bad news, but it's nothing physical. No one is going to die. It's about mom, Max began. Jane interrupted. She's done something horrible, hasn't she? Oh my God, is she running off with one of the lawyers? Joan asked, half-joking. Both girls erupted into laughter at the absurdity until they saw their dad wasn't laughing. Daddy, no, not mom. Joan couldn't finish her thought. Girls, listen to me carefully. Yes, your mom has been unfaithful, but that doesn't mean she has betrayed you. I wish it weren't true, but it is. If her actions are breaking up our family, then yes, she's hurting us, too, Joan said, tears streaming down her face. Max felt tears welling up in his own eyes. The girls hugged him, trying to comfort each other at the same time. Let's get out of here, Jane suggested. There's a park about two blocks away where we can talk more privately. Max quickly paid the bill, and they walked to the park, arms around each other. Once they settled on a bench, Jane said, Tell us, Daddy. We deserve to hear how bad this is. I agree. You're both grown up, he replied. Your mom has been unfaithful to me, and I found her in our bed with another man. She later admitted there had been others before him. I'm still in shock, but I know your mom and I cannot come back from this. I've already spoken to a divorce lawyer, and she will be served with papers later today. More tears fell as they absorbed the news, followed by a heavy silence. As difficult as this is, you both need to focus on your schoolwork. There's enough money for your senior year at Duke, and if either of you want to pursue graduate work, I'll find a way to support that, too. But there's a catch. They exchanged glances, curious. I'm happy to pay for your education, but I expect hard work and good grades in return. I know what your mom has done makes it harder to concentrate, but you told me you're grown-ups. Real grown-ups can handle adversity, right? They looked at each other, tears still in their eyes, but then they hugged him again. Yes, yes, Daddy. You're the best, and we absolutely won't let you down. Joan reassured him, while Jane looked thoughtful. Daddy, Joan's right. We won't let you down, but what about you? Are you going to be okay? What will you do? Well, you can do a lot of thinking during a two-hour drive. First, I want both of you to know that what you've said doesn't surprise me. I know you'll continue to do well in school, and I'll always be proud of you. As for me, what your mom has done has hit me hard. I could crawl into a hole and wallow in self-pity or try to find a way to reconcile with her, but I've realized that's not taking care of myself. All my adult life, I've been focused on taking care of others, your grandparents' company, my sisters, your mom, and both of you. It sounds like I'm complaining, but I'm not. The company will be sold soon, so that's one burden lifted. Camille is gone, and I promise I'm ready to focus on helping you both start your adult lives. So that's two home runs out of three in terms of relationships. Not bad, right? You know, I'm starting to see this whole situation not as the worst thing, but as an opportunity for a new life, one that's focused on me. Okay, Dad, if you really mean that, that's great, Joan said. Jane, a bit more skeptical, asked, What does a new life mean? Are you going to work for another company or buy a farm? Good question, and I have a good answer. No specifics yet, but this new life will be active. I'm going to run marathons, climb mountains, sail across the Atlantic, hike the Alps, and go on safaris. There are so many things for me to explore. And who knows, while I'm doing these things, I might meet someone special along the way. Wow, Dad, that sounds amazing. Both girls looked at him, astonished. This was their dad, not some adventurous figure they'd imagined. Did you really come up with all this on your drive? Jane asked. 
Yes, partly, but also because I haven't slept much. My mind has been racing with ideas. I could choose to wallow in self-pity, but instead, I'm determined to make the best of this situation. Trust me, I'm going to be okay. Max left his daughters with more hugs, kisses, and a few more tears as he drove back to Charlotte in the gold Mercedes. As soon as he left, the girls called their mother. Hello, a scratchy voice answered at the Tronders' residence. Mom, it's Joan and Jane. We just had brunch with Dad, and he told us some awful news. What did he say? Well, divorce was the big word, and your cheating was the cause. Dad gave us a little more detail, but that's basically it. Is it true? Oh, girls, it's complicated. Your father and I have been married a long time. And this, well, this mistake has happened. Yes, I've made big mistakes, but I believe we can work through this. I just need to give your dad some time. Mom, Joan interrupted. Dad said divorce. He wasn't talking about fixing things. Well, yes, technically he's right. But that doesn't mean we can't resolve this. I told him I would do anything. I think you're being delusional, Jane added. He told us he's already seen a divorce lawyer. It really sounds like there's no way back for you two. There was silence on the other end, followed by a shaky breath. Joan and Jane exchanged worried glances. Finally, Camille spoke, barely above a whisper. I know I've messed up and ruined my marriage. I think your dad hates me. And he's right. I've done terrible things. He told me to get a lawyer, and he's right about that too. I'm so sorry, girls. I know this is awful for you too. Mom, don't worry about us, Joan said. We'll be okay, and we know dad is doing his best. You need to take care of yourself, and getting a lawyer sounds like a good idea. Jane and I can drive over to Charlotte if you need us. Thank you, girls. That's sweet. I'll be okay. I just need some time to process what I've done. They hung up, still unsure what to do. It's funny, in a not funny way. We're more worried about Mom, who caused this whole mess, than we are about Dad, Joan said. They talked some more ultimately deciding not to interfere and let their parents deal with each other without their input. Meanwhile, Camille sat in the house in Charlotte, feeling a little hungover from the gin the night before and more than a bit depressed after speaking with her daughters. She knew she should get up, get dressed, and leave the house, do something. The doorbell rang as her thoughts drifted toward maybe getting some food. A young woman stood on the doorstep when Camille opened the door, chewing gum. May I help you? Camille asked. Yes, ma'am. Are you Camille Tronder, wife of Max Tronder? Yes, I am. Why do you ask? Ma'am, you have been served, said the woman, handing Camille a folder full of documents and snapping her photo. What? Camille stammered as the woman walked back to her car. Inside, Camille sat down at the kitchen table, her heart racing as she opened the mysterious folder. The title of the first document made her nearly faint, Petition for Divorce. She recalled Max's last words to her, Get a lawyer. Sitting in the familiar kitchen, memories flooded back, and she realized they weren't coming back from what had happened. Six years later, at an expensive hotel ballroom, Camille watched Jane dance with her new husband, her mind clouded with memories. As a teenager, life had seemed overwhelming. Too many activities, too much angst, and boys who were either too mean or too nice. Now she missed those days immensely. Still working at the same law firm, doing the same paperwork, Camille was jolted from her thoughts by Carl, her date, a kind, middle-aged lawyer. Here's your wine, he said. Camille looked up. Thank you, Carl. You're sweet. Your daughter looks lovely, just like her mother. Thank you for the compliment she replied, appreciating his kindness. Though he was a good man, he was not Max. Camille glanced across the room at Max, who had just returned from a climbing trip in Nepal. He looked incredibly fit and handsome, laughing with Joan and holding hands with a beautiful woman. Camille felt a pang of jealousy, recalling how Joan had said Max met her during a climbing trip in South America. 
It made her feel ill just thinking about it. Camille, Carl said, trying to get her attention. I think we should leave. You've done your duty as mother of the bride, and staying here, lost in thought over your ex-husband, isn't helping you or us. You're right, Carl. Let me say goodbye to my daughters, and then we can go. Camille hugged and kissed her daughters, wishing the newly married couple well. Ignoring Max and his companion was difficult, but she managed. As she left the ballroom, Max caught sight of her and felt a fleeting sadness for their past as he returned to his conversation with Joan. Dad, Joan asked, remember that strange gold Mercedes you drove when you came to see us at Duke? Whatever happened to it? That's quite a story, Max replied, but I won't bore you with it. I borrowed it from a friend and eventually gave it back. I think she sold it. It was really a bad luck car. He turned back to his climbing girlfriend, eager to discuss their next adventure. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.